Good morning, good morning, and good morning to you. It's a shocking drive to work this morning, not because it's not a lovely day. It is, but it's been raining for about two days and the car's really wet. And to be honest with you, it's more wet on the inside than it is on the outside. Because I drive an old heap, Peugeot partner van. Well, I don't know how many miles it's done. Hang on. It's got a thing where well, you put your finger through the steering wheel to try and find out how many miles it's done. 95,000. But it's a bit unfortunate if you have to go round the corner while you're looking and you've got your hand through the steering wheel on the button because you can't turn the steering wheel. So you have to be a bit selective about when you're doing it. Do it on a straight road. So, I was going to uh, talk about some of the characters that I've met in, uh, in dentistry. And some of the characters I've met have died, obviously. And funnily enough, I've done some interviews with some characters in the, in the profession who talked to me about characters that they met who've, who'd already died by the point that I'd talked to them. So there is a, quite a richer oral history in dentistry. So I thought I'd get my uh, six penneth in. I uh, have to be a bit careful because a lot of the people I'm going to talk about haven't died yet. <laughs> so it's always easier to talk about people that died because they can't sue you. Uh, whereas the people who are alive who, uh, who certainly can. But <clears throat> it might be worthwhile just starting off with the Chief Dental Officers because uh, the first Chief Dental Officer I remember was a guy called Brian Mowat. And uh, he is a, a lovely guy, I found him to be very charming. This was at a time when the Chief Dental Officer was at the top of uh, a pyramid, you know, at the apex of the pyramid of dentists. <clears throat> and then there was a short, there was a space above him so that he could then reach up and touch government. government or government could reach down and touch him if they wanted to know something. And um, I think the profession was <clears throat> very happy with that arrangement. You know, we like to think of the chief dental officer as being the chief dentist. Um, as you'll hear <clears throat> later on, it sort of um, it went another way. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, Brian May was, a, was, as I say, was a charming chap. And uh, he, as soon as he got uh, appointed as chief dental officer, by whatever shady committee uh, yeah, the Department of Health internally appoints these people he invited everybody round to, uh, to, over to uh, Richmond House I think it was in Whitehall and you know sort of sat down and said well uh, look at me you know I'm the Chief Dental Officer <laughs> how about that? who'd have thought that <laughs> Brian Murray would ever get to be the Chief Dental Officer <laughs> so, uh, you know, he said, I'd like to just go through you with the, you know, what the function of the Chief Dental Office is, doors always open, all that sort of thing. And um, <clears throat> he said, uh, uh, we, we, he made some joke about the next time he came, um, he could probably send a car for us because he wrote down like a long list of what, what his powers were. And, and uh, he said, uh, I think, you know, I can put on receptions and da -da, generally liaise with people. And uh, uh, But he never did. He never did send a car. Look, that next time we said, right, OK, you know you said you could send a car for us. Can you send a car for us? Um, and he was like, no, sorry. <laughs> but uh, with uh, Brian, it wasn't a case of uh, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. It was, it was more a case of... Um, you know, people said to him that, you know, you don't uh, squander your largesse on everybody. You know, these are the held to be the most important players in the space and uh, or actors as they're now called. And uh, so, and this is how it works, you know, so you've got to be institutionalized really. But um, I do remember 
we used to invite him to our annual general meeting and, and you know once in a while he used to pop along and this is the, the old uh, General Dental Practitioners Association which had been around since 1954 I think 50, started in 53 was sort of formally inaugurated in 54 um, wound up in 2009 on his 65th birthday if I remember correctly retired but um, he, uh, he used to come along and at the time I was Secretary General of the European Union of Dentists and I, I was queued up next to him in the um, queue for the buffet and that's, that's an old tip I'll tell you for anyone who's like an aspiring politician or an aspiring you know, well it's all politics isn't it you know whether it's a some stupid dental association or whether it's in the corridors of power uh, you know, someone said never refuse a, an offer to go to the toilet with someone. And uh, we used to meet at the Ariel Hotel in near Heathrow in the days when it was a, literally a circular building and uh, you know, still uh, <coughs> built in the way that it was very first built when Heathrow became the Bath Road became a centre for commerce because it was right up against Heathrow Airport. The A4 Bristol Road, and uh, it looked like one of those buildings in Stingray that used to go underground when the the old uh, bongo started going. <laughs> Anything could happen in the next half hour, and all the buildings would sink into the ground. And uh, it, it was a, it always reminded me of one of those because it was built in that sort of 60s uh, style. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, a lot of uh, agreements were broken in the toilets at the Errol Hotel because uh, we said, you know, does anyone want to have a, a break? You know, should we have a break and uh, 15 minute comfort break? And if, if someone you uh, wanted to do a deal with sat still at the table, then you would sit, sit at the table and cross your legs because you knew that everyone else would bugger off and you could talk to them privately and then. Uh, but if that person got up and went off to the loo, then you, you ran after them up the, <laughs> up the corridor to the loo. Because if you could get the stall next to them, you could have a chat with them while you were in the loo. Um, <clears throat> men obviously doing it standing up was a bit easier, I suppose, with women. It's probably, uh, uh, mind you, own women. But I'd be talking, aren't they? Sticking their makeup on and stuff like that. But, yeah, so. Brian Mayer was at the aerial and we were at the buffet and he said to me, is there anything, you know, particularly they'll be interested in hearing about? So I forget whether I was the secretary or the chairman at the time, I was probably the chairman. And I said, well, uh, you know, we've got a quite close relationship with the European Union of Dentists and it'll be nice if you could put something in on a, from a European angle, you know, encourage everyone to be a bit more, uh, interested in looking at what's happening in the other European countries and possibly uh, joining <laughs> a dental association that once a year went abroad and uh, and uh, oh, drunk to death, sorry oh my god there's a tractor around the bus unbelievable anyway he um, this is from a standing start, right? He got up and he spoke for about half an hour. And I'm not kidding, 20 minutes of that was on European integration. And I was just dumbfounded. I can only, to this day, I can only assume that it was the text of uh, another speech that he'd already spent a lot of time preparing. When I said something about Europe, he must have thought to himself, <laughs> that's, um, I'm on a winner here. That's uh, bingo, you know, that's my subject. But uh, <clears throat> he was uh, he was uh, em eminently uh, good, at, very inclusive, you know, would always uh, make sure that we got all the uh, notice government papers and discussion papers, white papers. That we got included, we got invited along to Whitehall, we were asked to um, 
give our thoughts and stuff and our thoughts were always considered they were mostly uh, any thoughts this won't come as a secret to anyone who's dealt with Whitehall so any thoughts that don't coincide with their thoughts get disregarded <laughs> so when they when they ask him for input whether it's you know feedback on one of their proposals or comments on something some white paper or green paper they've put out um, they're only looking to refine their idea they're not they're not looking for ways why their idea could go wrong or ways for reasons why their idea won't work um, their ideas already crystallized at that point they just want uh, they just want to know how they might they can sort of possibly fine-tune it and, and claim that uh, claim the credit for everything they just want like uh, you know <laughs> they're like an artist who's painted something and they step back and then someone walks in the room and says what do you think do you think do you think you could do a little, a little bit more white here or do you think her uh, eyes should be a little bit more blue you know they're not saying <laughs> they don't want someone to come in and say actually you've painted a picture of the wrong person <laughs> So, but uh, my, my, as I say, was probably the last uh, fully inclusive chief dental officer, and uh, I think the profession uh, profited mightily as a result. Uh, we did well, you know. I mean, we are. Uh, I think that dentistry is a unique profession in that it requires academic skills, clinical skills, and business skills. Very few professions require all three of those. And we were in the top decile of um, earnings of the country as a whole, which I think is about where dentists should be. I think in a market-oriented society, I think about tenth in terms of uh, uh, earnings, total earnings, is, is about right for dentists. Um, bearing in mind, as I say, that very few jobs require a combination of all three of those skills. And uh, also the value that society pays on the puts on being free of pain. So, um, <clears throat> so we got uh, invited along to health select committees uh, to give evidence, and uh, we were invited along to the review body on doctors and dentists remuneration, or the, doc the do doctors and dentists review body, as they always um, like to get called. It's funny, again in politics, you're, there is an unspoken uh, code, there, there is an unspoken sort of uh, way of talking, where, it, uh, and it's in life as well, you know, it's in, it's in every town, it's in every city, it's in every group, where there's an us and a non-us way of talking. And what you do is you identify as a member of the group by talking in a certain way. And uh, if you make the mistake of not talking in that certain way, then you immediately identify yourself as uh, not part of the group. And uh, there was a, I'm trying, uh, there was a funny, there was a funny lecture that the GDC used to give that was difficult to pronounce. And if you pronounced it correctly, then you know you're one of the crowd, the in crowd. And if you didn't, then you weren't. But uh, Moet was um, uh, succeed, succeeded by uh, Margaret Seward. Margaret Seward. Margaret came from the BDA, and by which I mean she was the first of the chief dental officers pretty much just to be promoted from the BDA to the Chief Dental Officer's role. She was the first one. After that, it became routine that uh, uh, the, the Chief Dental Officer was going to come from the BDA. Because they had this... Um, let's try and get that out of your eyesight. They, they had this sort of uh, arrangement, which and we've always maintained, I've always maintained that it's uh, bad for the profession and bad for the patients, which is that this is sort of the dental profession when it came to negotiations was a, a triangular boxing ring. And in one of the corners was the public, and in one of the corners was the, um, uh, 
the, the uh, professional representative, which was always the BDA, and then the third corner was the Department of Health. And what happened was the Department of Health always decided to gang up with the BDA and beat the crap out of the public. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, that's the way it was when I qualified in 1982, and it's the way it will be when I retire in 2025, whatever. Uh, and by which I mean, I mean to clarify that, by which I mean is that some agreement was always made uh, between the Department of Health and the British Dental Association that was to the disadvantage not only of the public but of the um, any sort of competitors to the British Dental Association and, and uh, of any competitors to any ideas that the Department of Health might have. So the BDA and the Department of Health always have always had a very cosy relationship and of course when the chief dental officer uh, is appointed by the department of health and comes from the bda that relationship gets cosier still now we, we might get into um corporate relationships with later chief dental officers who had very uh, close ties in the corporate sector and still do um but certainly with uh, margaret seward it was more of a sort of an academic and and professional, or well, more of a professional uh, connection. Um, and the BDA uh, benefited mightily, uh, not only because um, they were always able to say that, you know, if you want to support your negotiators, you needed to join the BDA, because the BDA was the only association that was recognised by the department as, uh, as a negotiator, even though it never negotiated anything never achieved anything, never tried to achieve anything. They just uh, sat there fat, dumb and happy. And the Department of Health paid them really to do that by funding various projects and, and bits and pieces that the British Dental Association wanted if they wanted to do, for example, the, um, they're talking about introducing vocational training. Uh, then, uh, then what would happen was the it would be decided that the British Dental Association would carry out the, the research and uh, the Department of Health would fund it. So there you go, you've got a whole floor of the BDA uh, being funded by the Department of Health. So, and uh, they always got uh, money, they always, uh, you know, if there was any, ever any money for trade unions or, you know, to support trade unions, if there was a Labour Party in power, then the British Dental Association used to get the money because um, uh, it was they would argue they were a trade union, even though they weren't, and uh, and the GDPA would argue that it was a trade union, which it was, <laughs> but it wouldn't get the money because who got the money was decided by the chief dental officer, more or less. Who uh, because the the, the count, you know, the government, the Department of Trade and Industry would write and say, look, we've got two applications here from the dental, two dental professions, uh, one of them, uh, you know, both of whom claim to be trade unions, uh, one of which doesn't, on the face of it, appear to be, uh, but um, the government does say that they are the only one it recognises for the purposes of negotiating. Uh, and so the chief dental officer would say, mm -hmm, let me think, of BDA, of course, you know, so. But uh, the thing about Margaret Seward was, she, she was inoffensive. She was, uh, uh, when she retired, she wrote an autobiography and published it through some, through the women's club, I think she was a member of, she was a member of some, it wasn't a woke women's club, but it was a, at the time, you know, it was like an all women's club and, um, and uh, gave away copies of her autobiography. And I think to Margaret, her life was intensely interesting, uh, but to everyone else, I don't think so much. I don't think many of those uh, books got read. But um, she was famous for um, posing for photographs with the same sort of rictus grin on her face. It was a bit like Wallace, out of Wallace and Gromit. And, uh, <laughs> and it was always the same. I mean, she must have had tens of thousands of pictures taken, that woman. And in every single picture, she looked the same. I mean, I used to joke that you could get a cardboard cut out and people could have used that instead of instead of the real person 
And the other thing she was famous for was um, being very um, punctilious. So if you said to her, like, I want you to do uh, a speech from 11 till 12, um, she would finish at 12. She wouldn't finish at a minute past 12, and she wouldn't finish at a minute past a minute to 12. Um, she wouldn't finish at 15 seconds to 12, or five seconds to 12, or one second to 12. She would finish at 12. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things when you were listening to Margaret Seaward give a lecture or a talk was what part of the fun was looking at the clock towards the end because you'd be looking at the clock and she'd be glancing at the clock and you'd be thinking oh you know she was a master of winding things up she could just she knew I don't know she knew perhaps that when she got a minute to go she got to start saying things like well and thank you so much for inviting me and uh, I hope you all have a you know a good day and blah 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 and uh, uh, and then and then that was it doing the clock used to chime and she'd be done but lovely woman but we didn't really get a look in with Margaret because she was she was just um, you know uh, editor of the British Dental Journal is what she'd been so you can't expect her to uh, to do much I suppose for anything anyone other than the BDA which is a shame because it's like um, You know, they didn't, they only lost, we'll, we'll, we'll go into later episodes about why they lost out as a result of uh, their sort of lack of um, plurality in terms of their inclusion. But anyway, that's uh, that's Brian Mowat and Margaret Seward, and then uh, probably next time I do a one on the Chief Dental Officers, we'll, it'll get a bit more interesting. Okay, bye for now.